So here we are. We are at the 20th Martial Arts Symposium. We're in Waterville Valley, and I'm, I'm loving this backdrop. I kind of wish we had the fire going. But I am. I wish you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little chilly in here. Dave's freezing to death. You know, 30, it was 34 degrees when I got up. What, what is it back home for you? Uh, yeah, a little warmer. <laughs> uh, but you know, I am. I'm just. I'm lucky to be here with these three gentlemen, and, and two of you have been on the show. We're going to get you on the show yes. soon, Chris. And I just thought it'd be fun to sit down and and chat and just kind of see where the conversation goes. You know, you just had a conversation with a bunch of the school owners talking about school owner sort of topics. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's talk about some things that might be more broadly appealing. I, I asked Buzz while you two were get, grabbing your coffee what he wanted to talk about. And he said how great martial arts is. So maybe let's start there. Yeah. You know, we've got, we've got time. Actually, Andrew, can, can, I, have that, can I have the hat? Because I don't know if they can all see, but you're all wearing a 50-year... Buzz Durkin school hat, and now I have mine. Thank nice. you, Judy. Yes, here we come. Yes, looking <laughs> good. <laughs> so now we're all, we're all matching. We're all in uniform. What makes martial arts so great? Mm. I think what martial art, what makes martial arts so great. One of the things, and it's multifaceted, is the fact that it can aid you in every aspect of your life. Mm. And as you go through life, life struggles, life's good times, life bad times. The martial arts can be a rock and anchor to help you deal with all the challenges that, that you may face and enjoy life to its fullest. Mm -hmm. I think what makes, there's so many things, right? Uh, but but I, I think every parent should have their kid, teach them how to swim and teach, have them do martial arts, right? But when it comes to like so many different reasons, the one I'll focus on first would be like confidence. Now, you know, the bottom line, if you look at it, you can develop confidence through doing anything. Someone can, through playing soccer, sure. or, but what makes martial arts unique is, that ability to inflict bodily harm. And what I mean by that is, is that, yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, that? <laughs> is that, that all of a sudden, you know, the, the kid on the playground, like if you were to go at any age, by the way, a predator is looking for prey, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just say the, if the only way we were going to be able to go home is to feed our families, we had to find someone we had to fight in a cage to the knockout. But we got to pick who we we're going to fight. We're not going to find the big, we're not going to find, you know, uh, Big John, it's not going to be the guy we're going to go against, right? <laughs> and so uh, uh, the, the point is, is what, what happens when someone develops more, uh, uh, starts training more martial arts, they project a different signal of confidence. Kind of like the average predator is looking, they've got their antennas looking for prey. You know, so as someone becomes more confident, their projecting confidence are less likely to be confronted in the whole, in, in, in the first place. And, and the other thing that goes along with that and what makes martial arts unique to other things is because of the nature that we're teaching is violent, it really obligates us to swing the pendulum to the other side and stress respect, courtesy, self-control mm. that, that you don't get in a lot of other sports because it, it, it's not necessary. Like, for example, my kids trained in soccer, played soccer for years, and they had great coaches. But there was never once when the coach said, now, Alex, don't misuse your, your soccer on someone because it's not an issue. But because we're teaching the things we don't, it really obligates us to really swing the pendulum to the other side so people get messages that they may not hear otherwise. Mm. It's funny you bring up soccer, and it's funny you bring up not having to teach that. I was flipping through TikTok just this morning, and it was a, a montage of women's soccer games mm. where things weren't going as the players wanted, and they're just hauling off. Mm -hmm. wow. and, and what I think, you know, you're talking about that pendulum swinging. We make a conscious effort there, whereas most other pursuits just kind of ride the societal line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no secret that people are angry, frustrated, and maybe a little less respectful than they used to be. And I don't, I don't know about you all, maybe you hear it with, with parents or you see it in your day-to-day -day lives, but there is a lot less respect and discipline and, and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to go the opposite way on okay. that. Please do. Uh, yes, I think that <clears throat> there's far more respect and discipline than, than what it first meets the eye. Mm. Uh, the Because the the challenge is Mr. Durkin's not going to be on CNN tonight. Uh, why? Because he's polite, he's respectful, he's courteous, he's humble. Uh, but if Mr. Durkin takes out an Uzi, well, <laughs> let me tell you something that's all we're going to hear about. Um, so I, I think there is the appearance of, boy, you know, kids these days and this and that. But we have schools full of 
teenagers and children that are respectful, courteous, humble, sure. uh, doing the very, very best that they can. And I do see it in other places as well, outside of martial arts. But I guess I want to be uh, optimistic because I see the same things that you see, Jeremy, but I just... I. I just want to refuse to believe. So, so maybe it's selection yeah, bias. Yeah, well, and it's also, it's been around forever. There's a quote, and I could pull it up in a second, but it goes like this. Uh, you know, kids these days have no respect for their peers. They won't stand in the room when their adults crawl. They, they're lazy, uh, thoughtless, signed Socrates. Yes. So yes. literally, it, it's a kind of a generational thing. As we get sure. older, we look back and are perceived. Not that there aren't areas of society that were worse, but I agree that... I don't necessarily know that in general. I think we're doing our share to kind of keep the respect factor there, you know. And, and I guess that begs the question, if if there's a, maybe a fight going on between societal pressure and what we're doing and trying to identify the best in people and, and resisting that, you know, kids these days instinct, how do we get involved in that? How do we use our position as martial artists, as school owners, as people with reach to, if not always keep things moving in the right direction, let's keep them from sliding? I'm very, I, I don't like to prey on people's fear. So for example, God forbid there is a, an abduction or a rape or something in our community. I, I'm not going to be the first karate studio that puts an ad out, hey, you know, defend yourself against rape, because mm. I think that's preying on fear. That being said, the media, and, and, and when I say the media, I don't mean to, like, make the media bad, but the the what what is in popular culture is an over it, it continually exposes an overwhelming need for confidence and uh cures for the obesity and, uh, mm -hmm. epidemic, etc. So I think as long as we're positioning ourselves as we're on this side and, and we're working against them, we don't, we don't really have to do anything else. We, we just need to make sure that what, what's reflected in our heart, what's reflected in our beliefs uh, is amplified within our community. Because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of parents out there that are fearful. And in some cases, uh, without really the facts to back it up, but they are fearful, they are looking for things. And as long as we position ourselves appropriately, I think, you know, we can help them. Sure. Sure. I think the ultimate goal of martial arts training is self-perfection. It's not that I can beat the other guy, the other guy can beat me. It's self-perfection. And how can we as teachers through teaching and exposing our students to the virtues of martial arts training, the virtues of being a black belt on a daily basis. That's, that's so powerful. Like, like Chris said, confidence, patience, mm -hmm. stick-to-itiveness, work mm -hmm. ethic, all those things uh, we present to the student and the parents are most appreciative of that. And I think at, at all our schools, I think we're developing absolutely leaders. Mm -hmm. We're developing people who are respectful, mm -hmm. courteous, hardworking, and these are the kids that'll that'll rise to the rise to rise to the top, and I think it's uh, we believe so strongly in the martial arts and its benefits. And selling is a transference of feeling, basically. Mm -hmm. So so we, we we feel so strongly about this, and we pass that on to the next generation. We're going to develop some some wonderful leaders. I, I'm so confident. Yeah, that. you know, the human mind is easily influenced by anything spoken with conviction. And when you believe in what you're doing, the people around you just kind of pick up on it. And, and, uh, and I think that's why it's such an important reason that we kind of stay connected to, to uh, you know, all the benefits of martial arts. Because that, that, then when we, you know, when we communicate that, people pick up on it a little bit more and they're more likely to, you know, be involved. Chris said earlier that I, have, I teach the most boring style of karate there is, and uh, that's de debatable. But... <laughs> But uh, it was a compliment. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't say that, and I don't believe it. Thank by you. the way, what is the most boring style? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Are... Where was I? <laughs> well, I, I you, you brought up fear, and, and if I'm hearing you correctly, Dave, maybe you don't even acknowledge the fear. You just you just leave, right? You say the good stuff with conviction, and just maybe ignore yeah, that, you know, that the, fear the pressure. Yeah, you know, like, 
like anybody here, we've all done self-defense clinics before. I actually have a program with Sacramento County. I have a, I have an, a, a contract with Sacramento County. We do what's called our Live Safe Training Program. And I've done hundreds of them. And I think it's a pretty good program, right? And the whole intention when I do this is you guys have all done a self-defense clinic where everybody comes in and they, they're scared to death. They don't know what to expect. Or if you've ever done one for like the county, they have to go. So there's a bunch of people that don't want to be there. And my goal is to have them leave empowered, empowered and feeling good. But the point is, is if you, the, the reason why there's very few people that have made their living teaching self-defense successfully, like that's what they lead with. It seems like it's because People are so concerned about that, you know, and so they kind of block it out. And the only time you ever get a good turnout, if that's what you do, is right after a bad event happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so uh, uh, it, it's like I think that's why you, you aspire to, uh, you know, uh, what the positive stuff versus uh, moving towards versus moving away from. And it's interesting. You guys remember back in the day when the, the Yellow Pages ad, the picture was a guy doing a flying psychic on the nose or, you know, grabbing the knife out of the hand. And, and that was how we advertised. And what we didn't realize is the general public doesn't, when they see that picture, they don't think of me. They think, oh, am I going to hit in the nose with a psychic? You know, because it's the fear thing. So I think uh, uh, because of the, the, we've got to really do a good job of when we're, uh, not just talking about the positive benefits and that it's safe, but really backing that up, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where do we take that? And, and what I mean is, I'm, I'm getting the sense that the three of you are pr pretty much in agreement in, you know what, we're, we're, we're just, we're not going to go there. We're not going to respond to fear. We're not going to indulge it. We're not going to let the world change what we do. Does that create an opportunity to maybe double down on some of the things that are historical, traditional, um, within our world, within the martial arts world? We can say, you know what, we've been doing this for a while. The world is you know, veering hard left over here. We've got to do even more of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got to do even, make even more... Go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say, I don't know if it's exactly the, the, what you're looking for, but I, I think as we become more digital and, uh, you know, more automated and AI takes a bigger effect, mm. I actually think that benefits us because I think there's the need of your real contact, you know, is, is going to become more and more scarce. And the better we are at it, it's going to draw people. You know, it's like it's like keeping that kind of human connection strong. The human connection is important. There's an, an old saying between the teacher and the student. There is only the teacher and the student. And that's very profound. And that, that idea of one-on-one, -on -one, you taking a personal interest in a student, that student, that person reciprocating, I think that's very powerful and very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Chris? I'd agree with both of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, I think when uh, emails first came out, mm -hmm. I started to be able to recognize, oh, this isn't <clears throat> my little trick. I Everybody calls me Chris. Anytime I uh, sign up for anything, I call it Christopher. So whenever anything says, hey, Christopher, I just wanted to touch base with you, I know it's that. So I created a little system <laughs> for identifying what's spam and what's mm -hmm. actually coming from someone personally. I've also seen that's now. why you never answer my email. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep calling me Christopher. Uh, I've also seen now, um, and and by the way, I'm not poo poo and AI. I Chat GPT blows my mind, and I'm using it more and more and more. I, I'm so grateful. It's like Star Trek to me. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I've started to see. Oh, okay. I can t I can tell this is AI generated. Mm -hmm. So to what these gentlemen were just talking about, AI creates a, a, a beautiful opportunity for the personal side of what we do to stand out even more and make us even more relevant because we're, we're going, we're not going against the tide. We're probably all using AI, but we're not using AI as a replacement for human connection. And, and it doesn't matter how, Good. all of these systems get we're still physical mental spiritual emotional people that we we need we need each other yeah what, what, one of the ways and i'm curious what you're doing with ai we're using ai to create more opportunities for time 
to spend more time. Yeah, if, if this thing I was going to do was going to take me four hours before, now I can do it in 10 or 15 minutes, and I've got that much more time to 100%. engage with my yeah. students or engage with our customers. Yes. Is that, that what well, finding yeah, for? and, and I, I kind of look at it like like I'm still figuring out how I can use it. You're right, you know, but I've had some things. I wrote in a couple notes that, that like, uh, I had it plug in, dis, you know, how to how to handle a disgruntled person in a very nice way in 100 words, and and I and I couldn't believe how articulate and empathetic it was. So I see the benefits of it completely. And the thing is, is that you can't, it's here. Like, like you know, we whine about, oh, everybody's on their phone. Well, the bottom line is, I remember I remember getting on a plane and looking at all the people on the plane ahead of me, and everybody was on a phone. And I'm kind of like, I, I can't, what the world's coming to. And I sat down, and I pulled out my phone. <laughs> you know, so it's here, and, and it's kind of like, so... So we got to embrace it and use it to our benefit. Sure. You know, either like that's the it makes no sense to 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 do anything but that. You know, but as a tool, yes, uh, yes. not as a replacement yes. for human connection. Yep. And uh, I, I, you know, maybe even Mr. Durkin's going to use AI, uh, but I don't imagine I'm going to get an AI generated postcard from him. I'm going to send you one, says Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> But it'll be spelled wrong, you know, with an F, yes. with an F in there somewhere. <laughs> yes. You know, you, you kind of danced around it, so let's let's go at it. Phones, connection, this trend within the world that we're we're watching having some pretty profound impact on youth. Mm -hmm. They don't have mm -hmm. The value, whether or not it's the skill, they don't seem to value. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a safer way to put it. For that human in-person connection, I, I notice it in some of my younger students that there are some things that I just mm -hmm. I need to interface with yeah. them a little differently. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, all the more reason why we're so important. Mm -hmm. You know, like like uh, how many of us you've all had this happen that someone came back from school and got their first job and said the reason I got a job is because they were impressed with my ability to look them in the eye when I shook their hand. Yeah. You, you know, you know, I'm talking about it's yeah. the stuff that we that it, that more and more, especially even post COVID, they're getting less and less of it. And so I just see us as that making us even more valuable and more important to really teach that generation of kids how to interact with others. You know, and the, the more schools that are teaching those things, the more schools there are like that. The, the better off for the society. I truly believe that. I know it, and I'm sure it's the same at, at your schools. The, uh, we're developing future leaders yes, even, and p people that aren't afraid to shake your hand and look you in the eye, little, little eight-year-olds or seven-year-olds. It's, how are you today, Mr. Dirk, and how are you today, Mr. Ruppel? And that's, that's, that's so wonderful. Parents see that, and parents, yeah, I want my child to have that. That's, that's, that's critical. I think I don't. I, just another thing that I, I guess I'm digressing a little bit, but I think post COVID, with all the stuff that's going on, I, I feel like our we've got to double down on 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 really being really clear on understanding the difference. Like one of the things that I'm talking about all the time with my team to talk to today and the parents is about the difference between the quit muscle and the perseverance muscle, because mm. it feels like it, it, in certain cases it's like uh, people let their kids. They quit sooner than they should or they quit themselves and and the, the whole point is we got to teach people that the only way you develop perseverance is by wanting to quit and not but if you wait until they want to quit to have that talk it's you're too late so that's it's like point. like having that conversation on an ongoing basis hey there's gonna be a time when you don't want to do this that's okay it's natural what are you gonna do when you get there and you know kind of educating the, the you know uh, so we can keep them in our program because there's something magical that happens when someone grows up in a martial arts school we've all seen it mm -hmm. Uh, you know, but it, it, it takes them to be around for a long time. And that's kind of on us to make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, make it hard for them to move on. Mm. There was a, a time uh, in a little phase I saw in some of the communications where people, for example, were fearful of not passing a child on a stripe test or a belt test because, well, I, listen, I can't afford people dropping out. So as a as a band-aid what they did is they lowered their standard mm -hmm. and they they maybe said well that's the best he can do right now or, or however they justify we'll, we'll catch him up before the next one absolutely and um i'm very pleased and proud because within uh, the culture that i've created at my schools thanks to these gentlemen is i we've we've done enough communication in a way where a parent will say I really appreciate that because you know what? He hasn't been practicing the way he promised you and you noticed. 
I really appreciate now there you. are consequences. I really appreciate you holding his feet to the fire like that. And now that enables us, it empowers uh, my teachers to not be gun shy, mm -hmm. but to be authentic in the feedback that they're giving them. And, and to Mr. Kovar's point, not failure is uh, is fatal. It's 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 feedback. And now here's the steps that you need to do to improve. We're, we're right with you. But I, I see more in you than what you're showing in yourself. I've seen you do better. So I want you to go back this weekend. I want you to practice it. And when you come in on Tuesday, let's do it again. I know you can do it better than that. And, and it's a different reality. And uh, for the short-sighted, I'm going to give them stripes and I'm going to give them this. I just, I think you're I don't see where it's sustainable over time. I have this fundamental belief in humanity that people are like goldfish. We grow to the size of the bowl mm. that we're put in. And I think a lot of people, you know, want, want to help others feel significant. So they shrink the bowl and that fish looks really big. That's a great analogy. And, and yet what happens when you take that same goldfish and you throw it in a huge backyard pond? Can I use that analogy? Yeah. By all means. I, I don't, it's, really not, it's not a, a Jeremy original. I don't know where it came from. I've been saying it a long time. But I'm going to say it's a Jeremy original. By, hey, yes. cool. You guys are welcome on the show anytime. Keep, keep there's puffing a, there's me There's a quote out of a line by, I think, we're, uh, at Marianne Williamson that goes, there's nothing enlightened, there's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people will, won't feel uh, oh, insecure yes. around you. you know? yes. It's like, a, yes. so true. It's like... A, Yes, sir. Society, I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, to kind of bring it back to where we started, sometimes a lot of us feel like we're in a, a whack-a-mole game, right? We start to grow. We start to do something significant. And I'm sure you've all received criticism. We get criticism all the time. Just by existing and just by doing something good, people look for a way to cut sure. you down because instead of them growing, they're trying to chop your legs out from under you so that yeah. the disparity between their effort and yours doesn't seem as big. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tell you, that's, I, we all, that's one of the my, kind of the mindsets I have is I try to deflect negative energy, right? And it's hard to do, you know, it's hard to do, but what's helped for me with, with that negativity is first off, I, I, I don't even, you know, like, like I, I don't, if I know there's stuff, I'm not searching to find stuff that's, you, you know, it's like, I'm not going there, but when I do, I'm reminded of a quote that my pop shared with me and it was hurt people hurt people. Mm. You know, so when you're, when you're, when you're like, you know, so the people that are lashing out, they got issues and it, somehow that helps me to deal with the criticism right, when, when it comes this way. That really is a good one. Boy, that's a, a second good one here. One of the things that I, I try to do is I try to take what I believe to be the most core aspect of, of martial arts into the rest of my life, which is how good am I going to get solo? Mm -hmm. Right. In order to progress, we need other people to test against, right? Iron sharpens sure. iron. So you tell me, hey, I'm starting a podcast. My genuine feeling was, cool, how can I help you? I hope he gets really good because that's going to drive me to get better. Yeah, that mutually beneficial concept is so critically important. As the student gets better, the class gets better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As the class gets better, the student can't help but get better. Right. So it's a synergistic well, yeah. And the instructor has to get better. Of, of course. So, so that's the, the individual gets better, the class gets better. If a class is getting better, technically, whatever, the individual can't help but get better. Yep. And it, it's, it's so wonderful when you have students appreciate that, understand that concept. It, it lends itself to such a marvelous spirit mm -hmm. in the dojo. Mm -hmm. And it's good for the teacher to articulate that and remind the students of that's what's happening. You know, we, the students have a lot in their minds. It's up to us to re remind them what a wonderful thing is happening. You, you help someone else get better in their life. They help you get better. This is, let, let's, let's go for another hour. I said in the last uh, visit we did in the, uh, the room across the way, uh, when it was off a point that Mr. Durkin was saying much like that, I think all of us as martial artists, we have to be able to connect the dots between, uh, let's say you and I are, are training. It's up to... Um, it's up to my instructor to say, you know, you really made Jeremy a lot better today. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you doing that because I might just, I'm used to, hey, you're my training partner, whatever, but, you know, I really like the way you work with him because I was trying to explain to him that concept, but I watched the way you worked with him and it, you like, you made him better today. So that is you know, so beautiful. I, I'm going to interrupt. Yes, please. Just last week, 
we had the same instance happen in the class. And I wrote a personal note, thanks for make, helping Erica look so good in class. And oftentimes we wait till something bad goes on before we communicate. So communicate with the good as well. And uh, that, that exact same thing that you're, you're mentioning yes. now, I had an opportunity to do. Thanks for making Erica look so, look so good in class. Mm -hmm. Wow, where'd that come from? I, right. I think there's this belief, especially among students or people outside, that the learning experience is one way and it's topped out. That the instructor is responsible for all of the education, but we all know that it's what, what I would call crosstalk. It's mm -hmm. that community. I, I tell my students, yeah, I, I'm in the front of the room. I'm leading the experience. I'm not necessarily teaching. I'm cultivating the environment whereby you learn. Yeah, and I think right. that there's a dramatic difference between the schools that recognize that, which I'm sure is all of you, and others where maybe there, there's a little bit of ego. No, no, I don't want you to show them that. Let me show it. You're going to show it wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. I think the uh, the humility of, of being a guide on the side instead of oh, the word guide. sage on the stage, I think... I think what I like about both of them as accomplished as they are and how revered they are by <laughs> by the industry and by their student. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but the re but the reason that they but the reason that they are is they're very selfless in their approach. They're not they're not trying to suck up all of the the attention and the praise for the work they do. They selflessly give it out. So that that enables, you know, let's say it was a classroom environment that enables the partners to share in the development of everybody instead of it all comes from Mr. Kovar or it all comes from Mr. Durkin. So I think the more humble that we can be, the more, one, it, it teaches a lesson of humility uh, and it creates a culture where people can grow and thrive and be reinforced for the correct behavior, which enables that to happen. How I, I, humility is so important. I've had a number of conversations this weekend with people about humility and, and that it's something we value so much as a community, as a community of martial artists, but maybe we're not always great at instilling it. Mm -hmm. How do we instill it? How do we help students who are getting contradictory signals pretty much constantly that humility is worth cultivating in themselves and others? So just to be clear, like I, I am the most humble. If there's a competition for humility, I, I would have voted for you no, for that. I, that. That comes from a Park and Rec episode. Oh, was okay. guy, it was the funniest thing. He, he used that. that was so great. If there was a competition for humility, I would be in first place. I thought he has no. It was the funniest thing ever. But uh, uh, you know, I, I think that you know all of us have ego, myself included. Sure. I even, even even Buzz has ego. You know, but I think it starts with teaching people. Uh, to there's a time not like there's how many times have I wanted to say, you know, kind of. Sh spout what I believe or, you know, what I've done. And, and, but I've learned to, even when that, when that ego comes out, just to shut up and not say, well, that, that mode that pass, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's, uh, uh, one of the ways I think it is by, uh, maybe you've got a few people that maybe are a little bit over, you know, at appearing it. And a lot of times it's because they're, they're compensating for maybe their, their insecurity, mm -hmm. but it is through, I'm a big fan of the Socratic method of learning, which means you get people in small groups and ask some questions, right? So one of the, one of the questions might be, imagine you put a bunch of people and maybe some guys, that their egos out of control, ask them who they admire, right? And you get them talking and they're going to, and what do you admire about that person? Mm -hmm. and, and generally you can kind of lead somebody to, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so someone that's not blowing their own horn all the time. And then you kind of have them, oh, well, talk to yourself. How, how, how do you guys do about that? And a lot of times people will kind of go, yeah, I tend to maybe brag more than I should. And it, it's a way to kind of I expose that without, mm -hmm. without being too direct, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes that can have an effect. Mm -hmm. don't you? No, I, I agree. And the students will certainly pick up on your vibe. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to us to, if, if being a black belt is truly about being egoless, even though we martial artists have tremendous ego, then uh, th that idea of 
projecting that humility, doing away with the ego. I mean, it's, it's, it's transference. Again, I'll go back. It's transference of feeling. People see something. I can't quite say what it is, but I see something in you that I want to have. I see a quality in you as my sensei that it, even if I can't put my finger on it, that, that you have that, that I want to have. And I, I mean, let's face it. People see things in, in the sensei that they want to have. If, mm -hmm. if, if, the, sure. if, if they didn't see anything that they want to have, they wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So there's some, sometimes it's intangible too. Sometimes it's subconscious. But to the, uh, that, that idea of seeing something in the teacher that you have a quality that I want to have. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's true. Sure. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, the, uh, it, when I started uh, um, martial arts, uh, I remember one time I uh, was lucky enough to score a point on my instructor, and he blasted me back, blasted me back, because uh, the, that, that method at the time was, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you twice as hard back, okay? And, and I am super grateful for all of the people, you know, that I've trained with, but at some point in time, I had to stop that cycle. So I'm in class, and somebody just, <laughs> bam, you know, gets me. At some point in time, I had to be the the renaissance person to say boy that was that was a really good shot but again when we're working here we're we're training partners so you know just be please let's be careful of control and not be like okay okay <laughs> all right you thought that was hard huh and because if you don't break that cycle then you create you know you're taking a step into the culture of the way it was and it's uh so you have to be able to you know find that place between stimulus and response in not to get too off there but in history the person that i've always admired you know the most is gandhi mm. for the reason that he didn't fight back all of the people in history that fought back we all look at them for their courage and their tenacity and their this i don't know if i'm a strong enough person to have you know my people killed and refuse to fight back. Mm -hmm. So uh, that you know, that's that ultimate example in my mind. So my little, <laughs> my little in my micro section of the the world that I can influence. You know, taking the hit and not responding with that force is my way of teaching that to the children or the teens or the adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one of the things that you mentioned that's just so important is, is our ability to, uh, uh, to break the cycle is that analyze what we do in our school and are we doing it because that's the way it always was. Like we had this tradition that I picked, it was an Ed Parker thing from American Kempo that after we got their black belt, we punched them in the stomach really hard, right? And then, it, you know, he would do the front kick and sometimes he'd miss and it would go low and it was like, a, so that was what we did. It was, and, and I remember one time, it just didn't feel right anymore. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, so it was, and then we did this thing where we'd take them in another room where nobody saw it happen. It was a secret experience. And, and then finally one day I go, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And it was a thing I had even this thing with every new belt rank with a black post, like a birth of a new baby. When there, when there's pleasure, there's also pain. Like, didn't I just beat the tar out of them for two hours? Or, you know? <laughs> and, and so we, we got rid of it. And, and what was interesting is we had a bunch of people initially that came up and said, can I have my punch? I don't feel like, you know, okay, I'll punch you. you know, <laughs> but how quickly that left. And it got me thinking, what other things that are we doing because we always did that aren't really a good thing? And right. by the way, the things we always did were it was just came up, your instructors or, or his instructor's instructor just came up with it on, on the fly one day in class and it becomes dogma. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, right. so I think it's important that we analyze, you know, the experience to make sure that we're getting results we want. We're driving in Mr. Durkin's formative years, I always remember monitoring to him, don't walk in the footsteps of the master, seek what he sought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was so proud when I clicked with them, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like what you're saying, though, because, you know, I'm hearing that story and I'm hearing what's going to create a conflict in the culture of I really want to earn my black belt. I'm dreading passing my black belt test. Right. And that that conflict is going to make people mm -hmm. resistant. Yeah. Right. Reward the behavior you want people to, <clears throat> to exemplify. I want people to train really hard and get better and pass tests and progress. Yep. 
why am I going to punish them for doing that well mm -hmm. by hitting them really hard? One of the things we have to develop to be successful is balance. Mm -hmm. And we have to have the balance of the training with the balance of the regular life, you know? How many times have you had a new student come in and they're so enthused about martial arts at the expense of going grocery shopping with sure. your wife? Yep. The expense of cutting the grass, <clears throat> and the, the company and say, "I love what we do, but I, I just can't. I can't do yeah. it. I can't make that 100%. commitment." You know, yeah. so it's. Uh... I, I think that, that that's why we stress. <clears throat> excuse me, that our new students we only let them come twice a week, People and, we and for that reason, because what happens wow. otherwise is with I, I don't care if someone's been around for a while, they get completely out of balance, mm -hmm. and yeah. said they get burned out really quick. You know, they see all this progress initially, and they so like I don't care how badly you love this. Uh, right now, you can only come twice a week. You know, yeah. let, let, we'll talk again in a year. We do know? the exact same thing. So for yeah. one year, our tuition is based on two classes a week. And for that reason, I want them to balance with, with mm -hmm. what's going on. Because they're so enthused when they yep. first start. Yep. It's at the expense of other important it things. Makes in their so life. much sense. I, I have not heard of a school. I'm sure other schools do that. I haven't heard that before. But I get it. Do, do you do something like that? Yes, sir. For the yeah. same reasons? I, I think so. The, the enthusiasm. Uh, I find... Um, you know, let me be stereotypic for a second. The dad that never really fulfilled his destiny of being a world-class athlete mm -hmm. enrolls his five-year-old and really takes to it. And, you know, I'm going to stop bringing him five days a week. And, and then the kid hates it. And, uh, and one of the things we teach is balance. Physical balance, for sure, but mental balance. And, and it's, <clears throat> it's a, it's a const, constant thing. Now, why, and I've had students, even adult students, why can't I come three times? Because I know it's in your best interest to come twice. Do you yeah. trust me as your teacher? I love yes, that Yes, I do. And it, that, that phrase is, chuyu de ari. Chuyu de ari, roughly translated, means moderation, variety, and balance in all aspects, yeah. right? You know, Black belt testing for my organization, because by that, by that time, whatever challenge I'm putting in front of them to officially earn that rank or that merit, I'm, um, I'm sitting there taking notes and evaluating the students so that we can improve. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I, I was their teacher or their, my instructors were their teacher, and if I'm putting them up for something that they can't succeed at, what does that say about our teaching? So mm -hmm. I sit and I take notes. I already know how the students are because we've already evaluated them. I'm I'm looking at it more holistically and saying, what can we do better? And I'm very forthcoming with that, uh, with the students and the parents. My evaluation there is not the individual merit, though I can give you that feedback. It's how can we be better because you're you're our product. You know, you know we. It's a sign of how how we're doing. So it's it's very different from that that egocentric place of we're gonna I'm gonna put something in front of you and I'm gonna I'm gonna make you fail and I'm gonna you know what's that expression? No bad students. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No bad students. If the student's bad, who's the teacher? Who's who's, right. who's teaching that student? You know, and one of the things that, like, just like there's somebody out there saying, well, I want my students to be, yeah, blah, 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 you know, don't want to baby them, yada, yada. Well, we've all been to the point. I remember having a very small school. I was struggling to survive. And, and, but all the students I had were really good because, you know, we'd go to the tournaments, we do really well because I scared away all the people that really needed the program. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the people I had on them were people that were going to be fine anyway. And so it's, it, it, and so what I think is important is that we ease people. We can make people, we've all taken people that were very timid and very, un and made them warriors. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but we got to kind of ease, we got to go to where they are, you know, and kind of ease them into it. And if we do that, you know, we, we can influence a lot more people than if we're too hard too soon. And that's kind of the, ah, you too know. Too hard too soon. soon was my mantra for so long. Yeah. I'll it show sure you how was, the way right. you uh, yeah. how tough it is. And I turned away more people who needed it the most. 100%. 100%. They needed it the yep. most. And through my lack of being a good teacher, I, I turn, turned them away. So, yep. Yep. so no we changed them. Was that self-reflection difficult? You, you just said it very plainly and very accepted. You called yourself a bad teacher at that time. And your question is? Was that difficult to face and say, you know what? This is on me. I've got to make it a took me. It took me too long to figure it out. I'm dumb. <laughs> it was a gradual coming to an understanding. And then I said, who, 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 who's, who's leaving? What did we do to that person? 
I mean, when someone would come in, I would take the two strongest guys. This was back in the 70s. I, get it. I would take the two strongest guys, have them come down in front of that person sitting down, watch them glass and start pounding their arms and their legs. And I think I'll show them how strong we are. And little does I know I'm this, this person sitting there going, these people are crazy. 100%. You know? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was the same with the, with, with the kids. We were so too, too tough on the kids, even with their promotions. When, when we, what, what is a little yellow belt? What is an orange belt yeah. with one stripe? It's, yeah. If you have the world's best yellow belt, they shouldn't be a yellow belt. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. That, yeah. That's yeah. really pointed. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Seriously, what the heck are they it's still a yellow belt for? Right. You know, right. You know, right. And, and this is not about lowering standards at all. It's just like starting being realistic with your expectations, right? right. You know, and, and uh, then bringing people up. Yeah. Right. I think, uh, you know, uh, our organization, and again, thanks to their mentorship, is we're very excellent at meeting students where they're at when they come in the school. If if I can meet them where they're at, then from there I can grow. And I think the mistake that I made was that I'd want them to meet me where I am. And I'd want them to meet my expectation as a beginner student. And, you know, with with all of the the attentional issues and the physical limitations and the injuries and if, if you, we don't meet them where they're at, we're going to lose them. I, uh, as, a, as an accent to help with my uh, jujitsu, I have a, one of my coaches is a black belt in jujitsu, and she's my yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And she's, inter, she's influenced my language. She'll say things like, everyone, you have, you've come here this morning to take the class. Some of you may have an injury. Some of you may have a little pain. Some of you may have been up late last night. Please respect the way your body feels. You're honoring me by being here today. And I know you want to push yourself, but please be in tune with how you feel in honor. So she, she creates an environment of non-judgment. She does not may allow us to be lazy because she knows her students. She knows, she can tell the difference if I'm being lazy or not. Um, but she's made, she's allowed it to be okay to let Chris be whatever percentage of Chris is there on that day. And it's okay. It's okay. And the best you can do that day is the best you can do. And I've gravitated to bringing some of that language into my black belt classes. You know, just the phraseology she uses and I'm not lowering my standards at all. What my students are feeling from me now is they don't feel probably unknowingly because it was never my intent. They don't feel like I'm judging them. It, it, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, you know, and, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And by comparison of what she has taught me, I think we could have done a better job. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that's been a, a nice language uh, that we've brought into our organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys do similar similar things? One of the ones that, that I've had a hard time with and I'm still working through is I grew up in an environment where if we were late to class, we were punished. Mm -hmm. And I got rid of that because I'd rather have my students there. 100%. I'd rather have them there late than not there at all. And if I punish them, I'm telling them, Show up on time or don't show up at all. So years ago, I, I trained under Grandmaster Junior Reed for a, a, a long time, and I, I respected and admired him greatly. He was a real big influence. And, and uh, But I remember one time, he used to have a, what's called a discipline set. And if you showed up for class, you automatically went over the corner and you were punished beforehand, right? You know, and it was like, he tried to do it in a loving way. But when someone comes to Clay, man, they, they're, they're stressed out, they're coming late. They say, sorry, I'm late. I would say, I'm glad you're here. You know, and which is the truth, you know? And it, a lot of times they say, well, the kids, it's not even their fault, right? How, why would, you how know, can how they would, drive to the dojo? Se Seven-year-olds are never the reason that, that they're late to, <laughs> yes, to yes. class. No, man. It, it's like, you know, we, we, I think what's important, especially if there's a trend, like it's the same person that's always late. You're going to say, hey, mom, is there anything we can do to, you know, I noticed that we're having a hard time getting Bobby here at, at four o'clock. Is there anything we can do? Is there any way I can help? Like, you know, you, you know, is there something? In the, but but if it's, you know, every now and then it happens, it happens. You're just glad they still showed up. We have a mantra at our school from the white belts to the black belts. You're never late at Buzz Durkin's karate school. Mm. That's that's that. Little kids aren't unresponsible for them getting there. And when adults come, 
even if they came in a half hour late, I'm happy they came. Yeah, they 100%. made the effort to come. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. They could have been anywhere else, and yeah. they still chose yeah. 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 to spend their time there. Absolutely. Right. One of my um, <clears throat> one of my uh, friends uh, that grew up in uh, in the same kind of environment that I did, he had a um, he had a bulletin board when I walked in his school, and it said the Wall of Shame. <laughs> And I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, "Yeah, what is the what's the wall of shame? Are those the people that haven't paid their tuition yet this month?" <laughs> I, I knew a guy that would put on a, 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 like a, a brown tip on the belt, and he called it the baby tip. And if you whine during class, you got a baby tip. And, it, it, and, and by the way, he's not in business anymore. <laughs> Shocker. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, 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 shouldn't say this. No, I, I shouldn't say this, but back in the early days, this was way, way back. We're talking 1974. Give me the year. 74. I was five. All right. <laughs> it was negative five. We had a bulletin board. We put the best bruises uh, on the bulletin board with a Polaroid camera. <laughs> and at the end of the week, we'd pick who had the best bruise. Who had the best discoloration? That was yellow, green, blue. That's the most 70s martial arts thing I've ever I, I, I heard love in my that. life. We, we had a bulletin that. board. We, 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 Polaroid, we take a Polaroid picture. And stick it up there, and at the end of the week, let's, let's, uh, let's, you, you yeah, see. Yeah. So that's why after class, you see two two uh, six year olds round kicking each other in the thigh, really, hard, you know, like because they want to get up on the be board. Up there. People are over on the side with a oh, with yeah. a yeah. Don't, yeah. don't let that don't it's let that go. Away. Away. I don't know what that, it's too late. It's yeah. make a good Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but you know God. what's interesting is that, like when your wisdom comes from experience remembered, you know, and and it's a, it's like a, it, can we learn from our mistakes and every. Buddy that's been in this business a really long time, you, either you, you learn early or late, but you eventually, you know, you go, oh, that wasn't really smart. It's not, but you got to pay attention. You got to be analyzing. What did I do well? How can I get better? And that's got to happen on a regular yeah, basis. That's it. I mean, yeah. one of the things that if I'm teaching a black belt class in this 25 black belts in class, I'll do different ways to welcome them. For instance, it's, I'll go to the back of the line and shake everybody's hand before the class begins. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Uh, classes lined up. Everyone wants to do their best and work really hard today. Take one step forward. The class takes one step forward. We're, we're committed to it. So even at, at the end of all of our classes, all of our classes, we we bow out, and then the, the sensei stays there, and the, one by one the students come by and shake hands, or give a little hug, without fail every, every class to make that that bonding that that come. My students have started clapping. When class ends, I'm just like, oh, yeah, kind of like that. Which is great. Um, <clears throat> sometimes people hear things like that, and they think, oh, you're, you're getting soft. It's not soft. We're, we're teaching human beings. We want, that, we want that connection and love. And my personal belief is this. When you feel that somebody loves you, you'll walk through fire. 100%. You want to raise your standard. Let the students know that you're you're asking them to do something out of love and belief in their abilities, not out of anger. And they will. You, you want to raise the standard in your school. Make sure that they feel that. There's a story that his that profoundly, and it's from the the mid '90s, affected me. There was a, a woman, and I won't mention her name, but. At what she did, I would never have gotten in the ring with her. She was absolutely vicious and world-renowned. And we were at lunch. I brought her into my school to teach. And I was asking her about her training methodologies. And she talked at length about how her instructor would hit her and mm. slap her and hit her with a stick and tell her she's no good and mm. all of that. And I said to her... I said, you know, you got to be number one on the planet Earth, like with that. Have you ever wondered how good you could have been if you had somebody that actually showed you that love and support and kindness? And here's what I wasn't expecting. This, this woman who I feared, her eyes welled up with tears, and she said, I think about it every day of my life. Because in the process of creating that warrior, he he broke her spirit, and he missed the he missed the whole flipping thing. And I've never forgot that. 
I want to I want to put a punctuation mark there because unfortunately we do have to wrap. I know you guys all have other stuff. I want to thank the audience, both in in the room, as as well as watching and listening. Uh, how can people get a hold of you to do website, social media, any stuff? If you want like to send that? me an email, send it to Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Rappold, uh, dot Chris at Gmail. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Christopher <laughs> uh, Rappold. Feel free to reach out. Buzz at buzzdurkin.com. And I'm... Uh, I'm old school. I'll talk to. I, I prefer talking on the phone than I do emailing, and I prefer see, meeting in person than yeah. I do the, on the phone. So, I'm very easy to get a hold of. Buzzdarkin.com and over there. Dave.Kovar at Kovars.com is it. I appreciate. It. It's been a great. It's been fun on the on being on your show. Appreciate hanging with you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jerry. All right.